paint. It was when painted. When you are actually looking at it in a photo. Yeah. But you are blessed enough to be here and see it with your own eyes. What's that underneath this ear? Dude? Oh, we'll, we'll talk. We're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. So I want you to recognize, family, that you are seeing something that you have to now ask yourself the question that we started this trip with once more. Why you? Why have you been able to make this journey of 4,000 miles back thousands of years to reconnect yourself with the excellence of your African ancestors? There must be something that you have been divinely ordained to do and that this journey is part of the information, of the material for your personal ascension. So I want you to think about that question along this journey. And you know we're coming back to it because I want to see what answers you think that you come up with when we conclude. So, you know that this is often called the Sphinx. And I want you to understand that that name really translates to something like strangler. Because when the Greeks got here, they saw amazing things, but they had very little understanding of the things that they had seen. So they believed that this beast would come to life and ask you three questions. And if you did not get the questions correct, they, it would snuff your life out. It would choke you to death. That is not what this structure was structured, was built, was designed to do. Now first let's talk about the design, then we'll talk about who we think might have designed it and its possible age, and then we'll conclude from there with some meditations for you to take home with. Really quickly, you should know, notice right away that this is made up of two animals. Let's say that, right? Which animals do you see? A lion and? Human and a human head. Now there are tons of reasons why we think that it may have been structured this way. But I want you to note something. Do you notice that the lion is much larger than the human head? Yeah. In some ways it's out of scale. Right. Oh. There are people that have lots of articulations as to why they think that's the case. But I'm going to give you the theory that I think is strong. In actuality, the concept here is that if you being Heru on the horizon, Heru Emake, are able to do those things that will allow you to reach your higher self. If you're able to do the meditation, the prayer, the study, the, the, the spiritual and moral discipline, what will happen is you will be able to have control of your animal self. And some of us think the animal self is a bad thing, but just think, as you stand here, you're digesting food, you're, you're actually transmuting oxygen in your blood. The animal is very effective. And the animal self does some very divine things. Imagine if through study, through prayer, through meditation, through all of those things, you could have access to the full power of this animal self. It would mean that you'd have control of your urges. It would mean that you would actually have your life in your own hand. This is the greatest meditation of this. Because you'll note that the human surmounts the lion body. The lion we know is a very powerful animal, correct? Yeah. And the lion is not rearing for a fight here. It's laying in what we call recumbent form. It's tamed. And it's tamed because you and your divine self are able to look towards the horizon. That's why it's Heru on the horizon. What is the horizon? Not, not quite the solstice where the sky meets the earth. That's the horizon, right? So now let's think philosophically, what is the horizon? Where the heavens meet. Yes. Where the heavens meet the material plane. Yes, let's go further. In a sense, the horizon is where light breaks the darkness. Where you, do, where you are able to achieve higher illumination. Seek the light. <laughs> this is why we seek the light. That's the meaning. Seek the light. I know some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. That's fine. That's good. That's good. But clearly you must understand that when you are looking at the horizon, you are finding illumination, you are finding enlightenment. And through that enlightenment, you will reach your higher self. That is why we see the human head that is crowned here.
you should also know that we believe that 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 this being might have had three crowns. It has the Nemes claw. Say Nemes with me. Nemes. That's the claw that we see most um, often. It's probably painted leather. And then it also had what was often called the Shemti crown. Say Shemti with me. Shemti. The crown of upper and lower Kemet on top of that. Or Pashunt. Sometimes called the Pashunt. Now keep in mind that the beard is missing. By the way, the beard, a large part of the beard is where now? Which museum? Good answer. Not at the Met. It's in the British Museum. Anika and I saw it actually while we were there. A large part of it is in the British Museum. Where's the nose? Where's the nose? She is fixated on this nose. She asked me this question before. She said Jabari has not answered that question. I need an answer. Why is it that his African nose is missing? Well, you need to understand that your nose clearly identifies you. Let me take a quick step back for a second and tell you something painful. Do you know that when Brother Philando Castile was murdered by the police, did you know that when the police officer called it in, what he said? He said he might have been, he might have been a, a suspect. And the person on the phone realizes how strange it is, said, how do you recognize him? What did he say? I see his nose. There's a bigger commentary here. Mm -hmm. Your wide nose, taking up all the oxygen around you, family, mm -hmm. feeding your incredible ancient brain, is one of those things that designates you as an African. For thousands of years, in fact, probably for tens of thousands of years, you wore it as a sign of royalty. But it is offensive to some. Who removed it? Sometimes we, it is said that Napoleon removed it. Today it's not believed that he removed the nose because we have an older drawing where it doesn't have its nose. Brother Gamel gave an interesting analysis of this, that there was actually an Islamic zealot who was here, who was offended by the fact that people would come to this statue and rub it for, um, in order to become fertile. And he said, this is nothing but paganism. So he came to destroy it. But I want you to understand that many people have been attempting to destroy this because you are standing at not just an amazing, amazing site of great civilization, but you're also walking through a crime scene. This should be yellow tape here. This is the world's greatest location of identity theft. So there are people who have been trying to hide who these great originators of society, of civilization, of religion, of mathematics, of astronomy, of, of law, of science, of, of literacy. They want to hide who those people are. And if you recognize them, perhaps it says something about what you should be able to bring into the world in excellence. That is why this offends people. But you are here, brothers and sisters, because you are not offended. You are inspired. Mm -hmm. All right, say that. And so I want you to take this yes. with you. That even without the nose, you know, you recognize your foreparents. Looking out for a greater illumination so they can do the work that they have been asked to do by the Creator. Now let me conclude here really quickly. Say again? Well, I don't want to go into the colors yet. This, we could talk about this for an hour. We don't have an hour. Let me talk to you about who we think it is and, and how old it may be, right? And then I'm going to conclude. Now, there's some people, most people believe that this is actually a carving that represents the builder of the second Merkut. Mm. And the builder of the second Merkut, does anyone remember his name? Waka, 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 his son. <laughs> waka, waka, What's his name? Waka, waka. Say his name with me. Kafra. Oh, Kafra. Okay. Their names because our ancestors said in order for them to live into eternity, you had to say their name. While you catch in hell in Philadelphia, New York, Harlem, mm. Brooklyn, Baltimore, Atlanta, wherever you are, maybe you're still catching hell because we have not asked for assistance. Mm -hmm. We must say their name. Yeah. And so this may be Kafra. There are reasons why they believe it may be. First of all, it's aligned pretty well with 
the um, with the Mirku. In addition to that, there's a causeway, a tunnel that, that is off alignment a little bit. So it's believed that when they were carving it, they found one block of limestone. This was originally made out of one stone. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. What you're seeing at the bricks is the repair. So there's some people who argue that this is Kafre. There are others, and I want to give you both of these stories very quickly, that believe that this may be much older. And one of the reasons they make that argument, if you look at the encasement, can you look behind the divine Harold Market statue? Can you see how those, those blocks have fissures in them? A major geologist came to look at those fissures, and he argued that those fissures were created by great rain. That they could only they could not be done by sand, they could not be done by wind, they would have had to be done by water. So then that what that does is this pushes the date for this not to around 2600 BCE, but to maybe as old as 15,000 BCE. That is a conjectural story. There is no proof of that story. But I want you to understand both of them. And and what we are saying is. Not only was there a great civilization that built these Mirkuti, but there may have been great civilization here that is older than anyone knows. One of the reasons why people are uncomfortable making things older is because the older it gets, guess what happens? Fewer nations even are in existence. In 2600 BCE, where was Europe? Do we have any record of any European people in 2600 BC? They were still black people. No. <laughs> there's no record of them. <laughs> there's they no say that, that same DNA, there's no Rome, that same... There's no France, there's no yeah. London. All of those places, in, in effect, have no recorded history during this time. They didn't mutate the yet. The older you push things, the further away other peoples are. And so they can no longer attempt to pretend to be the people mm -hmm. who designed it. But I want you to understand that even at 2600 BCE, they can't do it. At 15,000 BCE, you could forget it. And so before we leave, yeah. make sure that you pay homage, yes. possibly to Kafra, but definitely to the concept of your excellence. In you fact, to the blueprint for your resurrection. You need to recognize, maybe, yeah, maybe we could do that. You, you need to recognize that this is here to tell you about what you have to do. So we could talk about what it's made out of, we can talk about who it is, those are important. But the most important thing is, what are you gonna do when you return to your city that is going to be emblematic of what these great Africans do? And so, um, you do want to lead us very quickly, at very little time. Okay. Uh, 